Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mojo podcast. This is episode number 35, and I'm recording today on Friday, August 4th, 2017. My name is Joanne, and I am obviously the host of this podcast. Um, special uh, hello to all my returning viewers. I'm so uh, glad that you've chosen to come back and um, spend a little bit of your time with me again this episode and a warm greeting to all new viewers. I hope that um, if you've checked me out for the first time here that you'll enjoy my podcast, uh, which is all about knitting and, and crafty adventures, pre predominantly knitting, but sometimes a little sewing, sometimes a little spinning, sometimes a few other things like that. Um, and I hope that you'll enjoy it and consider coming back and watching again. And uh, if you do, please consider um, subscribing in the down bar below and uh, liking the video. Um, likes and subscribes help me um, get um, listed on the uh, uh, suggested for you page on YouTube a little more often and uh, perhaps uh, draw attention to people who may not have watched the podcast before. So it's great and really helpful to me if you if you are willing to do that if you like the podcast. Um, as I said, my name is Joanne and um, all my information is on the in the credits at the beginning, but um, every once in a while I like to uh, mention it here as well. Just for people, if if you're interested in uh, following me on Ravelry, my username is Auntie Jo, all one word, A U N T I E J O, and on Instagram I'm Auntie Jo, the same but with the numbers one two afterwards. So Auntie Jo one two. We have a group um, for this podcast on Ravelry called Creative Mojo Group. Creative Mojo, I believe, is just called. If you go into the Groups tab and search uh, under Groups, search for Creative Mojo, the, that group will come up. And hope you'll consider coming and joining that as well. We have some lovely people in there, and we do some knit-alongs and occasional giveaways and things like that. Yeah, so that's all the um, the sort of nitty-gritty details, I guess, of, of the administrative sort of stuff the podcast. Um this it's been about three weeks since I recorded my last episode and uh, I had hoped to actually record a little more um, uh, with a little less time in between than the three weeks and I apologize for it being quite so long of a time um, but the last two, I normally record on Saturdays today is actually a Friday and I have the day off from work so uh, I took advantage of doing that today we um, we're having an we have an extended long weekend um, once a month we have what we what's called a golden Friday which is a, a, a Friday that we get off, which is a really nice little perk. And they often try to attach it, if possible, to a long weekend, so we get the Friday and the Monday, so a four-day weekend. Very exciting. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, I had try, I did, wanted to record both uh, the last two weekends before this, and both weekends uh, it didn't end up being a possibility because I was dealing with it, some um, issues, spending some time with my father. I've mentioned once before, a little bit earlier, on, some episodes back on the podcast, that uh, my father is 80, I think he'll be 83 in, in September. And he's um, he's got a, a little bit of um, dementia going on, unfortunately, which is sad. He It's not terrible in terms of, you know, he doesn't... Um, he doesn't forget things like who the members of his family are and those kinds of things. It's not long-term memory, but short-term memory is really effective for him. And uh, it's gotten to where it's generally not advisable for him to be left alone at home. It's just for safety reasons, you know. So to spell my my stepmother, his wife, off sometimes in the, um, uh, the large responsibilities of caregiving, my sister and I uh, try to spend time with him when we can and let her have some time. Um, to do other things and last weekend my sister and I went and uh, spent Friday night and Saturday day there to let uh, my stepmother have a night off and uh, she went to a nice hotel and had a sort of spa and massage and stuff like that and then this past weekend um, uh, I had hoped to record on the Saturday again and then um, long story but that my sister needed to do a shopping trip for back to school shopping for her kids and my my stepmother wanted to go but couldn't leave my dad at home so I went and met them spent the day a uh, part of the day the middle part of the day up at the mall with them while, and they did their shopping and I took my dad out for lunch and uh, spent a little time with him so my Saturdays got kind of taken up with that and it, it ended up not leaving me with uh, enough time to podcast um, 
as I've mentioned before, I, I try to do this when my husband's not home um, because I'm kind of situated right in the middle of the house. <laughs> it would require banishing him to the basement or his, his office in the back or something. So I generally try to take advantage of when he's out of the house, which is usually Saturdays in the day. So anyway, blah, 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 right? <laughs> um, let's get on to what we're here for, which is talking about the knitting. And I have uh, quite a few things to talk to you about because it has been three weeks. I have two finished objects, which I'm really excited about. So let's get into the, I'm going to show you those. Um, the first one is the, my August socks. I've been doing a, a pair of socks a month, um, some months more than one but definitely at least one pair of socks a month. That's part of the sock bash for the Grocery Girls podcast. Um, that's a year long knit along. And I'm also doing the, um, um, the for Kristen of Woolen Vine Yarns, her podcast, um, I, uh, Yarn Gas Apart podcast, it's called. I am doing the Box of Socks Cal this year. So um, that's 12, box, 12 pairs of socks a year. And, and happy to report, this is pair nine for my Box of Socks. So I'm well on track. Also drinking, in case you're wondering, some lovely um, iced tea. It's a David's tea. They have a lot of really nice teas in the summer, sort of fruity teas that make excellent iced teas. And this is uh, orange passion fruit. And I just um, cold brew it in the fridge, put it in overnight. And in the in the morning, I have really lovely, tasty, light tasting iced tea. So it's delicious. And my throat is actually extra. I know often I'm kind of croaky and... Uh, when I, especially when I talk for kind of an hour on the podcast and my throat is extra croaky today. We've had, um, here in Alberta, um, I don't think I mentioned that at the beginning for, for any new viewers that I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we've had a lot of, um, smoky days, uh, that all the, all the forest fires in British Columbia and, uh, along the border in the mountains. And there's actually some into, I think into the sort of border between BC and Alberta and we get a lot of that smoke we've had a, quite a lot of smoky days and uh, the lot yesterday was pretty smoky and today is kind of smoky again and um, that it really bothers me I really notice it I get in sinus headaches and a lot more congestion and it's kind of like having allergies except it's just the smoke so uh, apologies in advance if I uh, clear my throat and stuff more than usual Anyway, let's get on to my first finished object, which is my August socks, which were for our um, uh, Cookie A Cal that uh, is running in our group. I'll talk a bit more of that, about that in a moment. But these are the Point L socks by Cookie A, knit out of the Fawn and the Fox yarn in the, her Badger base, which is a BFL nylon in the colorway terrarium. And I love these and I really enjoyed knitting them. They're a beautiful pattern, as you can see. Um, I did actually give them a light block um, to, to open up the, there's lace in these lovely sort of, uh, swirling panels that swirl around the leg and they are, um, opposite on each leg. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so they, one goes one direction, one goes the other, and they have this little bit of lace at the top and then they go into this pattern that swirls around the leg in two different directions so these these are going this way and this one is coming around and sort of consuming those stitches and then it goes into uh, lace at the foot I'm gonna show you that lovely lace pattern that is on the foot again which is the same as the lace pattern that's on the cuff and they're so pretty and this is just uh, as I've talked about before this this yarn is one of my absolute favorites I I love the way Lara dyes, her colors are beautiful, and this base is just fantastic, this BFL. Uh, it's really nice to knit with, it get, gives really great stitch definition, as you can see. Um, and it feels nice and hard wearing, but it's soft at the same time. Um, sometimes I find BFL a little scratchy, but this is not at all a scratchy base. So yes, I'm very pleased with these. These are going to go into my box of socks, and this will be <clears throat> pair nine for the year. Um, so only three more pairs to go to get to 12, and it's only the beginning of August, so doing well. 
So yes, that's finished object number one. And as I said, that is for our Cookie A Socks Cal that uh, was running through June and July. Initially, I had said that July 31st was going to be the uh, closing date of that cal, and I put a, a note in the group. I have extended it to the end of August. I know there were several people who were working on socks um, that they were having trouble finding time to get finished, and I know that a cookie socks take a little longer because they're generally a, a pattern sock and it's not necessarily slightly more complicated pattern. And B, I know how pe busy people are with holidays and all kinds of other things in the summer. And uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody that wanted to get a pair of socks and had a chance. So I've extended that to the end of August. So if you're still working on a pair of socks, you still have uh, the rest of August to finish those up and enter them into the, enter a photo into the finished object thread in the group. And if you, um, uh, have uh, if you haven't started a pair yet but you'd like to get in on that cow you have all of the month of August and you can hit any pair of socks by the designer cookie a. and there are many many pairs of socks both from more complicated pairs to uh, more more simple and easy to knit monkeys I always recommend her monkey socks which are a free pattern um, through the website knitty.com um, you, you find that link if you find the uh, pattern page on Ravelry I think there's a link to the to the nitty um, pattern page through that. And um, those are, uh, if you've never knit monkey socks before, they are quite fun. They are an interesting, lovely pattern. They look really great. They're good for anything from a wildly variegated yarn to a striped yarn to a, a solid color. There any anything in that, in the spectrum there is gonna look good on, with the monkey socks. They're a perfect pattern for that. Most of the ones, I've knit the, that pattern like six or seven times and I've always used actually uh, a fairly wild multicolored um, speckled or or variegated yarns and they always look good so um, and they look impressive but they're actually a pretty easy pattern to follow and to sort of uh, memorize and and get through without they're not as they're they're deceptively simple as how I would say it I guess and as I said cookie a, a has everything from actually very intensely kind of complicated patterns with uh, twist uh, twisted stitch cable patterns and stuff and some um to those those the ones I just knit the point out socks I found while they look really elaborate and they look really fancy and and like you've pulled off an amazing sock project they're not anywhere near as hard as they they looked I found I found them pretty intuitive and after a while I did have to look at the chart quite a lot um but I did find that after a while I got better and better at um uh, uh kind of instinctively knowing what to do without having to look at the chart at every moment, which was great. So um, the, I would say those are kind of a medium to medium hard to hard range sock pattern, but not, not as hard as some as she's got, and definitely she's got lots that are much easier than that. So she's one of my favorite, favorite sock designers, which is why I was holding the cow, and um, I've knit many of her socks, and I always go back to them, and I will keep knitting them again, and um, because, I, I just love, she's so innovative and creative in her designs for socks. And she does create these, you know, you can create these beautiful works of art of socks. And I found that, um, I was thinking about this the other day, that um, I learned a ton of techniques through knitting um, socks through designers like Cookie A. There are a few others that have the, the same kind of uh, wonderful creative expression and patterns of, of uh, an innovative sort of sock ideas. Um, Hunter Hammerson has some really great sock patterns that that will challenge you and create some beautiful things that her book of Silk Road Socks is one of my favorites. Um, and, um, oh, who else? Um, gosh, now I'm drawing a big blank. Uh, there's a, a British sock designer that has wonderful, um, uh, she's a new line of yarn called Socks Yet. And I can't think of her name right now, but I will put it in the uh, link bar down below here and I will also put it in the show notes I will mention these other sock designers if you're interested in checking them out um, and there are there are others as well but um, those are some of my favorites and and what I found is that doing a lot of, of socks that had cables and lace and all these other things it was great for learning a lot of those kind of techniques uh, and becoming confident in cables and becoming confident at cabling without a cable needle and all those kinds of things. So <clears throat> socks are great for that. If you um, are a, a fairly, <coughs> excuse me, if you are a fairly beginning knitter and you haven't, you would like to try out some more complicated techniques, but you're a little afraid of maybe a big lace shawl and all that kind of thing. 
a, a pair of socks with some simple lace on them can be a great way to kind of get yourself into learning some lace knitting and with some confidence. And if you make some mistakes and you don't want to have to think back and you, it, they're your socks and they're going to probably be in your shoes and you're the only one that's going to know they're there. So um, it's not, again, you know, a shawl or a sweater, um, those kinds of things, they're more out in the public and more people is, are going to see that and you might feel more concerned about, uh, about leaving a little mistake. Socks are great for that because they're going to go on your feet and in your shoes and as long as they fit you and, and keep your feet warm, then if, if you were using them as a bit of a learning experience and you made a few mistakes, that doesn't matter, right? They're socks. So, um, anyway, that, that is that. Do, as I said, do come along and join in the Cookie Cal if you, if you still are working on a pair or if you would like to try and finish a pair by the end of August. The second finished object I have is, um, my So Faded sweater, which I am very, very pleased. I got this off the needles, um, not very long after I finished the last episode. Just a few days after, I think. And I've talked about it a bit on, on this podcast before, um, but I hadn't gone into too much detail about the about the actual design and stuff, so I'll talk a little bit more about that today. I'm not wearing it. It's a bit warm to wear a sweater today. Um, I will put in a picture at the end of... Uh, if you stick through to the end of the video, I will put in a picture of... Um, of the finished object that you, so you can see it in better detail. There are also some uh, pictures on my uh, Instagram page and on my um, Ravelry project page. I'm also going to stick at, I realize I did have a third finished object since last time I, I recorded. I don't have it with me anymore, but I'll put a photo of that in as well. I knit a little baby hat uh, for a friend that was, and it's a little football hat. It's super cute. Looks like a football. <laughs> it looks like a baby's wearing a football on the top of his head. And um, I had gave it, gave it to the friend who gave it to the, the people with the baby that she wanted to gift it to. And uh, she sent me a photograph of the baby wearing it. And so I'm going to put the, the picture of the FO and the baby wearing it as well at the end of the video. So um, you can stick around and see those. So here is my cast off finished beautiful so faded sweater in all its lovely glory um <clears throat> i knit this out of skein yarn which is a, a, a australian dyer one of my absolute favorite favorite uh, yarn dyers uh, kirsten of, of skein yarn um she's a podcast as well skein yarn studio and our skein studio, I think, and I adore her yarns. I have lots and lots of them. And this was a great way to use up a bunch of single skeins. Um, the So Faded Sweater is by Andrea Mowry. If you don't know it, you probably do. Tons and tons of people have knit this sweater, plus lots of people have knit her other um, faded fade technique shawl patterns and stuff. And this employs that same fade technique. Um, now I knit the, I knit the largest size. Um, I, and I learned a good lesson. I, I struggle a lot with sizing for sweaters. I am, uh, I'm not slim <laughs> is the way to put it, I guess. Um, I do, I take a larger, uh, size in sweaters, but, um, as we all do, you know, we all have different body shapes, right? And learning how to, for me, that journey of learning how to figure out a, what things look best on my body shape, but also be how to kind of tailor sweater patterns to fit me uh, well. Um, this was a good learning for that because what I, I knit actually a little bit the size too big. And I'll tell you, um, basically I am, I'm not hugely large busted as some, some women my size uh, are more well endowed in the bust area than I am. Um, and I, but I carry all the weight on my body um, through my middle section. I don't have a a huge butt or huge boobs but I have all my weight kind of right in around the middle of my body and more so the older I get um, as, as is often the case um, and I prefer not to wear clothes that are super super tight around my midsection and draw attention to that I like things that are a little looser and that float away a little bit I, I tend to kind of like an a-line shape that will kind of be uh, reasonably fitting through the bust and the top and then a little bit float away from the body. Um, 
but what I tend to do often in sweater knitting is I err a little on the size of, because I do like things a little looser fitting, I like a little more positive ease. I tend to err on the size of going up a bit over what I should for my bust size in order to feel that it's going to be comfortable and, and loose fitting through my midsection. And this was a good example of I kind of shouldn't do that really what's best for me uh, and probably what looks best to me and feels most com comfortable is to knit it to the actual correct size and have it a little more form fitting to the top and then add some increases if I need to. If the pattern is not quite as A-line shape as uh, I would like it to be, it's easy to add a few little increases and uh, bring it out. You can like bring it to the next size as I go down or just add a little bit of a little bit more of that kind of shaping you know um, and that's what I should have done in the sweater actually I should have knit a size smaller uh, and then just added a few little increases in in the body after I'd split for the sleeves and the underarms this sweater is knit uh, a raglan style from the top down it's easy to try on when you knit a sweater in that pattern you can slip it onto waist yarn or extra needles or whatever so you have lots of room in the of the live stitches and try it on and, and see how it fits and I and it was when I sort of after I got through dividing for the sleeves and into the body and tried it on that I realized it was going to be a bit big so so unfortunately it is a bit large through here and where that really kind of shows up is is in the raglan uh, under the underarm here it, it does it looks fine on and it, basically what it looks like is sort of a little bit like an oversized sweatshirt and it looks fine and I'm gonna get lots and lots of wear out of it and um, I wear oversized sweatshirts and stuff at work lots so it's not that but I did realize I could have done a better job of sort of tailoring it to fit me if I had as I said done a little bit more of those alter, uh, alterations because what I did was just knit the I think it was the 52 inches what I did um, and I just knit that size all the way down, followed the pattern exactly, and it turned out to be a little bit too big in the upper arm and in through the busts, and I could have gone down a size there. Like I said, then started some extra increases down the side through here. So I kind of wish I didn't. I did three quarter sleeves, um, they end just below my elbow, which is great, because I almost always push sleeves up to that length anyway. I like to have my forearms free unless it's really super cold. Um, but most of the time I'm, if I have long sleeves on, I'm pushing them up towards my elbow anyway. So that was a perfect sleeve length for me. She gives you options on, on shorter sleeves and longer sleeves. So I said, like I said, I did three quarter length, um, just below the elbow. And I did, I didn't do the, um, cropped sort of, she gives a shorter and a longer version of the sweater, obviously. Not liking to draw attention to my waist, the last thing I want is a sweater that's cutting me off right there. So this this goes down just below my waist, sits uh, sits just below my hip line actually. It's great in terms of length, and it's great in terms of size in the bottom of the sweater. It's just the top. I I use five single skeins of skein yarn. I um let's see if I can remember the colors here. Um, Cheshire Cat, uh, and then it uh, changed into a color called OMG and then pumpkin spice candy is this one here and then uh, I'm not gonna remember that I never remember that fourth color but I think I have it in my uh, I don't do I have it somewhere in my notes nope um, I do have it here though uh, hang on a sec I'm going to go get it. Back. Got my, I had to get my back. I meant to bring that over with the sweater anyway, and I totally forgot. So, so where I'm saying there was, um, pumpkin spice candy was this color here. The next color was eventide, which for some reason I can never remember the name of. And the last color at the bottom was apple cart. Um, these are I, all skeins. I think that I got from her, um, um, yarn club of the month so I don't know whether they are have become regular colors in her shop or not but she has lots of colors like this she's, she's so fantastic at dyeing these sort of speckled and variegated yarns and all of these went beautifully together I found that the the secret for, uh, for how I like a fade to where it really dies pretty seamlessly you can't really see where I transition from one color to the next um, Basically, you knit with one color and then you stripe in the second color 
for a number of rows and then you drop the first color and continue with the second color. Then you stripe in a third color, drop the second color, continue with the third color. And because what I find is it's pretty seamless, those the way that the, they blended from one to the other. And for me, the secret was I picked a color that all <clears throat> picked yarns that all had the same base color. They were all a, a cream base color and, and had a fair amount of light base color and then they had colors in common in the um you can see a little bit more like the striping there different circumference of the sleeves the yarn played a bit differently but and a little bit there but i mean I, so i picked in this case all these colors shared some pink in every one of them i think even the apple cart yep they all had some pink in them and there was most of them had a little bit of purple purple blue kind of so they they all had colors in common and that base color which really helped so anyway uh um that's that's how i chose the colors and that's how i striped the sweater and the last thing i was going to talk about was um I, so i used five skeins i could have done this sweater with four even at the largest size um the amount of yarn i had left over pretty much equaled 100 grams so i i, I um um, I could have gotten away with it with four colors, but in terms of the color management of knowing when to switch colors and how to, to save the colors back for the sleeves and stuff, basically what I did, I started with the first color and as I got close to the, as I was getting lower in, in the amount I had left of the first color, I realized I was probably just going to get through splitting the sleeves with that color. So I didn't really need to save any over for the sleeves. That first color was just going to take me through kind of to the armpits. So I, when I wanted to figure out where, how much I needed to, where I needed to start striping in the second color, um, I would, um, when I got down to, I think about 25 grams left of, or 30 grams left maybe, I'm trying to remember how much I ended, this is what I ended up with left over of the very first color I used which I would say, actually I'd say probably this is 20 grams. So probably when I got down to about 30 grams of this, 35, somewhere in that neighborhood, I, I would weigh it before I did a row and then weigh it again after I did a row and figure out kind of roughly how much I was using per row, which was probably about a gram, I guess. I don't remember now, but that's what I did. And then I would, then I when I knew I had uh, enough left to do 10 rows of striping, so five rows of this and then five rows of the other color coming in. Um, so I could have actually used up more than this, but I did s basically start fading the color, the second color in right around the time that I split for the sleeves. So I used all but about 20 grams of the first color. Then the second and third colors got used the most in the sleeves. Um, and so what I did for that was I knit um, with the second color, which was um the oh my god uh, omg that's basically all i have left of that third color i think i thought i had one more tiny little ball but i had sort of two little ball tiny balls i think that size that's all i had left um so what i did was i knit uh in that striped it in then knit in that color for about four till i had about 40 grams left and then i started introducing in um, the second color, actually 45 probably I had left, started introducing in the second color and then took what that 40 grams kind of that I had left after that um, once I started, or, sorry I'm not explaining this well, introduced the third color in. When I finished with the second color I had about 40 grams left. I split it equally into two balls so I had 20 grams and 20 grams to add in equally in the sleeves and then I was just keeping track of how many rows I did until I started the stripe of the next color in one sleeve so I could match it in the next. So I was basically doing a lot of sort of just weighing my yarn and making sure that when I uh, stopped using that color in the body of the sweater, I was leaving enough to divide into two balls to add some into the sleeves. So, so I had like two balls, like I said, about that big left of that second color when I'd finished the sleeves with that color. The third color was the pumpkin spice candy, which I love this color of yarn. Uh, and that's what I had left, which is two fairly equal, again, small balls after I'd finished the sleeves. Then of the um, fourth color, I had about this, which is altogether probably about 30 grams, 25, 30 grams of yarn. This is actually the same, 
about the same amount. It's just wound differently, obviously. And then I had quite a bit left of the last color. I think I have, I think I have half. I think I have about 50 grams left of the last color. So all together, like I said, this really did come out to about 100 grams. But so I could have done it with four colors. And if you're not making the size I'm making, if you're making a slightly smaller size, you'd get away with uh, runaway ball. You'd get away with. Uh, easily four skeins of yarn probably at the smaller sizes even three so tons of fun highly recommend it and uh really looking forward to wearing it once the weather cools down a little bit um and i think that's everything that i wanted to say about that sweater so let's move on so those are my finished objects and let's move on now to talking a little bit about uh, works in progress and after the finished objects, I, uh, after finishing that sweater, I was feeling sort of uh, obsessed with all the sweaters. Well, for two reasons, I was obsessed with all the sweaters, or actually maybe three reasons. Um, one of which was I really enjoyed knitting the silk-fitted sweater, and, and I always want to have more hand-knit sweaters. And I have quite a lot of uh, sweater quantities of yarn in my stash, and all that kind of thing but but one of the things that really got me going with wanting to knit more sweaters was, was I started watching a, a new to me podcast and many of you may already know this podcast they have lots of viewers but if you don't I'm gonna highly highly recommend it uh, it's called the fruity knitting podcast and I don't know why I never discovered this podcast earlier as I said it is they have lots of viewers they've been around for just over a year I think and it's a husband and wife they're Australian but they live in Germany and um, and it's the best podcast. I, I, I watched one episode and went, oh, so, uh, why didn't I notice this before? This is exactly at my alley of what I love the most in podcasts. And I went back right to the beginning and watched all their episodes from the beginning. Uh, that kind of was all my TV watching for about a week. My husband was out of town and in the evenings I would come home and I often would watch those because he, um, he wasn't here to mind if I was watching podcasts on the television. And, uh, yeah, I, I kind of deep dived into that and I watched all their episodes up to the current one over the case over the span of about two weeks and enjoyed it so much. They have an amazing um, um, Andrew and Andrea are their names and Andrea is a an amazingly talented garment knitter. That's pretty much all she knits is garments and she does incredibly beautiful sweaters, incredible color work. She's knit a bunch of the Alice Starmore um, Tudor Tudor patterns and stuff if you are familiar at all with those very elaborate beautiful detailed color work and and construction and they're incredible and um, a lot of them were you know steaking and all that kind of uh, stuff that that really elaborate color work sweaters can get you into and she's also uh, some amazing cabled sweaters and she very much loves uh, garment knitting and very uh, detailed and beautiful and elaborate sort of garments and and they're just stunning looking at what she knits is just really inspirational um and her husband is a new knitter so you get in terms of their their knitting content of what they're working you get everything from the kinds of projects she does that all these elaborate projects and these very detailed projects and these very skilled projects to his very simple sort of learning curve and she keeps challenging him to learn a new technique with everything he knits so he knit a little color work hat and he's knit some cables and he she knit himself a, a sweater which was mostly stockinette and simple but um but still a whole garment and uh, very impressive and uh i think recently she got him onto knitting brioche so brioche so um you get kind of the the new knitter experience and the really experienced knitter experience both which is fantastic and there she's and Andrea in particular is very good at talking about the details of how of what she does she does lots of sort of explanatory how-to videos on different techniques which is really really useful and then they also do a lot of interviews and they have interviewed all kinds of they've interviewed designers and they've interviewed um, sheep farmers and they've interviewed um, um, all different kinds of people and I, and I eat that stuff up that the, the, their interviews are fantastic and their choice of the different people that they interview is really interesting and and I have learned tons and tons of things and um, found it extremely inspirational and and that was the main thing was I was watching this and feeling very very inspired about 
upping my game with garment knitting and really being a little more adventurous. And so I did that. And a part of how I did that was I thought color work is one of those things that I have never felt that I really uh, um, tackled in any significant way. I've done cabled things and I've done lots and lots of lace knitting and, and I've knit, you know, shawls and hats and socks and garments and all of that. Uh, but color work has, has never been a strong suit for me. I've done a few little projects in it. Um, so I just decided I needed to dip my toe into color work, a color work garment. Now, not that I was going to do the Alice Starmore elaborate color work garment to start, although um, I've done myself a little bit of more of a challenge to start than I had intended originally. But uh, I thought, oh, I should, you know, I want to start with something that has just a color work yoke. Those are going to be a top down sweater. It's only got a smaller amount of color work, um, but they look beautiful. And I picked up a copy of Lane Magazine. I, I don't have it here right at the moment to show you, but lots and lots of podcasters have shown Lane Magazine. It's a uh, Scandinavian, I believe, uh, magazine, although it's, it's in English. It comes out twice a year. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. The patterns in it are incredible, and I want to kind of knit everything that's in that book. But I started with, I really uh, wanted, there's a pattern called the Birkin Sweater by Caitlin Hunter that's in that book. And it is a cable work uh, uh, yoked sweater. And I was very captivated by that. I don't, as I said, I don't have the book with me. I do have, I did actually um, photocopy the pattern pages just so I could mark them up as I was working. And that's a drawing of what it kind of looks like. So you can see it just has this color work up in the top. Um, <clears throat> hers and a lot of other people's are knit in a, in a kind of cream white um, with pinks and yellows and greens and blues in here, very summer flowers. Now I, um, as you can see the color chart there sort of shows you, I um, I didn't, I used different colors. I did use the yarn that she used for, for it, which is Brooklyn Tweed uh, Loft, which is their fingering weight. And as I showed you on a previous episode, I had some skeins that I picked up. Um, uh, I had some stuff, <clears throat> a few skeins that I picked up uh, about a year ago on at um, Church Mouse Yarns, Church Mouse Yarns on Bainbridge Island in um, just off, uh, just outside Seattle. <clears throat> and then I had a few more skeins that I picked up at Stash, my one of my um, wonderful, wonderful local yarn stores here in Calgary. And so I took what I had and I supplemented it with a few more skeins of <clears throat> from Stash again. Um, so using the colors I already had and sort of supplementing that to have enough to make the sweater. So the body of mine, and I cast it on, and uh, I watched a whole bunch of videos about two-handed color work to, and watched a bunch of stuff that, listened to a bunch of things that Andrea talks about on the Fruity Knitting Podcast to kind of up my game in terms of, of figuring out um, the two-handed color work technique and and I dived in. Now what I discovered, interestingly, after I jumped in and, st and committed to this pattern and, and got all the yarn and, and, and stuff, I don't think I'd actually cast on yet, but is that a bunch of the yoke is actually three color color work. <laughs> so, you know, go big or go home, right? Um, <clears throat> so I'm wading through, I'm just to the point here where I'm about to start working with three colors. So I will be, uh, figuring that out. But I've, again, I've watched a whole bunch of videos and kind of figured it out. And it's not, it's not that hard, just a little bit more yarn management really. So, but I started on this and I'm really loving it. And it's very slow going for me because I'm working really hard to keep the tension good and to try to get, so hard to show, but I just started into the yoke there. Um, as I said, my main color is gray and the, um, I'll walk you through in a minute the colors that I'm using. Um, that looks a bit black on the camera, but it's not. It's actually just a deep, a lovely deep navy blue. Um, I am doing, I'm doing this two-handed, so I'm holding one color in my left hand and uh, picking that color, um, which is not how I normally knit. I'm a right-handed uh, English knitter, and I'm a thrower, um, so I'm doing that with my with one color, and then I'm holding the other color and picking with it in this hand. Um, I am catching and trapping the floats as I go. So I don't have a lot of long floats. This is a technique that uh, Andrea uses and highly recommends and, and shows on her podcast how she does it. And also there are lots of other video links. There are, I have I have some shorter floats. The longest floats I have in this are three 
um, every three stitches. The other thing she uh, talks about and shows, which is really, I think, great, is weaving in your ends as you work. So this is woven in already, as is this woven in already. So all I have to do will be, after I wash and blo block it, is just trim those ends. I won't have a million ends, which is all, one of the things that's daunting, I think, about color work. So um, it's looking pretty good on the inside, and the tension is pretty, I'm pretty pleased with the tension. As I said, it's very slow going for me. It's a lot slower than I would normally, but I'm really, really enjoying it. Um, I'm a, I, so, that's the gray, which I don't know if I can remember what the color name for the gray is. And I don't know if I have a tag in this bag, but, um, and I did do a swatch. I didn't do, I should have done more of a swatch than I did. Bad swatcher, because my swatch is only this big. But I swatched both the stock and out, and I did swatch some of the color work. And I did find that I was, uh, close enough in, uh, I was exactly in tension down here, and my row gauge is t a tiny bit m longer here than what they call for, but not very much, So, and I can adjust that as I go, because it is a top-down sweater, so, and I was bang on, as I said, in all the stock in that part, which is the, the majority of the sweater, so um, I did this, I used the technique for the color work part of this, where I just knitted to this end, cut the yarn, came back, Rather than act, um, because the color work is all done in the round, you want to swatch in the round. Um, and rather than swatching in the round, I faked it by always knitting, no purling. So I would knit to the end, cut the yarn, come back, rejoin the yarn, go back that way again, all knitting across. Um, anyway, um, like I said, I can't remember the name of the gray color. I'm bad. It'll be in the show notes. But so the gray, and there's more of the gray is what I'm using for the main body of the sweater. And I have... I think six skeins of this Brooklyn Tweed comes in 50 gram skeins so and then my second color um, oh sweatshirt that's the gray is sweatshirt um, the one I don't have the tag for is the navy blue but as I said so this is a navy blue yeah that's a better representation of that color they're lovely and tweedy as well um, all of the uh, Brooklyn Tweed yarns Brooklyn Tweed, right? Um, the the third color, which I'm just adding in, is this gorgeous purple. That's actually pretty pretty true. Beautiful, beautiful purple, which I love. It's called Thistle, that color. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm going to be using um, Fossil. And I'm going to be using Tartan. So mine's all in sort of blues, purples, and grays. Uh, neutrals. Uh, and what I did was kind of replace the colors in the color chart. Um, so the, p the, the pink in the color chart was replaced with purple. The yellow in the color chart was replaced with white. The lighter blue in the color chart was replaced with this teal blue. And the uh, green was replaced with the dark. So I will talk to you a bit more about this as it progresses. As I said, uh, this was it is slow going. This was about four days of, uh, four evenings of knitting on this to get that far. And, um, I mean, I got, it was quite quick to get to where the color work started. It's the color work that's going to take me the time. Once I get past the color work yoke, it, the rest of the sweater, which is just plain stocking it, will fly off the needles, I suspect. So, but I'm really enjoying that. And I'm really enjoying sort of dipping my toe in that and going slow at it and trying to learn how to uh, improve my color work technique and all of that. So there's that, the Birkin sweater by Caitlin Hunter. And then I'm working on another sweater. <laughs> now this is a sweater that I actually uh, cast on back in, I think, January. I've shown this at least once, I think once before on the podcast. Um, I'm making uh, this for a, f my, a friend of mine at work, my friend Denise, who's a uh, longtime friend and co-worker. And um, she's a great lover of uh, handmade. She's a wonderful sewist, and she actually sewed me a beautiful top um, a couple of months ago as a gift. Just surprised me one day, brought it into work, and said, I made this for you. It was lovely. Um, and her mother was a knitter and used to knit her sweaters, and she's she's one of the most knit-worthy people I know. She is so appreciative. I've knit her socks and a couple of hats and a, a shawl and lots of things. 
and she wears them all the time and she looks great in them. She's a uh, tall, she's almost six feet tall, tall, slender, very fashionable kind of, um, it, well, not high fashion necessarily, but wears, looks fantastic in clothes, tall, long, lean, has done yoga all her life, has that, you know, tall, long, lean yoga body. Um, totally built differently from me. And I do find one of the things that I enjoy about knitting, a lot of people don't knit for other people. Um, I do a fair amount of knitting for other people in between knitting for myself. And one of the things I enjoy in knitting for others is that I can often knit things different in different sizes and different styles. I, the, the sweater I'm knitting for Denise is, is a really cute sweater, not something probably that I would wear myself. Um, and it's going to knit up way quicker because it's a much smaller size than I would knit for myself. So I kind of enjoy that. So I'm knitting a pattern called the Yellow Wall Cardigan. I don't have an actual um, photo, but there's the schematic of it, which will tell you kind of what the shaping of it is. Up top here is a, a essentially a funnel collar. Um, buttons all down the middle. Um, it's designed to have really long sleeves that are fairly close fitting and kind of are long and kind of bunch up down here. It's quite cool how it looks. And it is designed for a longer back than than the front by a little bit and splits at the side. I think I'm not going to do the difference in length from front to back. I don't. Denise and I talked about it and she wasn't keen on that feature. But everything else is bit as written. I'm using, it's a fingering weight sweater. I'm using Volmiza. Um, <clears throat> this is deep stash. I had it for five or six years in my stash, I think. And uh, she loved the color of this. So this is what we went with. And I am this, oh, and that's actually showing the color beautifully. Look at that. Just wants to be kind to purpley reds today. Um, that looks lovely. So this is a top down raglan again. It's that funnel collar, um, which is kind of, so it starts with that collar there. It's got a fun kind of construction where you do increases in this, I don't know if you want to see, you kind of can. The increases are in this sort of zigzag through the collar, which helps create kind of the cool funnel shape, and then goes right into the body. So I'm just finished the raglan increases for the um, arms. Um, my row gauge again is off a little bit on this um, because partly because I went down a needle size from the recommended needle size, which I was a little closer. Or, or, I was ever so slightly a bigger gauge on that, but ever so slightly a smaller gauge on this um, because Denise and I said we like the fabric a little bit better at a, this is a 3.75 millimeter needle as opposed to the four millimeter that's called for in the pattern. So I just have to be careful to make sure to be looking at the length of my sweater. So I finished the sleeve uh, raglan increases, but I'm going to, I'm adding a few more rows to it before I separate for the sleeves to make sure it's long enough there and there are good measurements on that schematic so I have lots to go by. So as I said I'm using um, the Volmiza. Uh, this is um, this is the first ball. Volmiza is great. It's a Volmiza Pure which is 100% uh, Merino. If you don't know Volmiza it's a lovely uh, yarn out of Germany. Her She's the most color saturated dyer I think I've ever come across. For a while I was kind of obsessed with it and I ordered a lot and I have a lot in my stash. I haven't ordered it in a while because I have a whole bin of, of a couple of sweater quantities and lots and lots of single and two skein quantities. Um, and her skeins are really fun because they come in um, 150 gram skeins, so really good yardage. So I think I will get through this. This, as I said, um, is what I have still to work on of the very first skein. I'm not alternating colors. I will alternate the color. They're all from the same dial. The color match is pretty good. I will stripe them. I will stripe this in. So if there is any slight difference in it, uh, it won't be a, a just one line through the body. So when I have, when I'm down to not too much of this left, I will start adding this in and some stripe striping to blend it in. Um, but uh, this will definitely take me through uh, the first bit of the body as well. So I may actually get away with two skeins of this. I have a couple more in my stash, but, and because I'm also using some black in Volmiza. And so the cuffs um, from about here down are going to be black and the bottom of the sweater uh, in a band about 
probably inch and a half to two inches will be black. And this is um, similar to the way that some other people have done on their project pages on Ravelry. And, and Denise and I were going through and looking and picking a sweater and stuff. She really liked the two color options that some people did. So um, I have two swatches in my bag. Like I said, this is the swatch I did on the four millimeter needle and this is on the 3.75. And we both agreed that we just like the firmness of this fabric a little better. Uh, this is a little bit more, as you can see, you can see through that more than you can see through this. So, um, and this was a bit above gauge and a bit below, so I'm just compensating for my gauge being slightly different. So that's sweater number th uh, two that's on the needles, and that, that's been cooking along, and I sort of switched between, you know, when I'm tired of the how slow I have to go in the color work, this goes really fast. The last work in project that, uh, work in project, work in progress that I have at the moment. Uh, got some some good work last weekend. Um, this is uh, my second knee sock. I've showed these off on the podcast before. Uh, this is a pattern I worked up myself, um, which is, has a cable that goes up the back of the knee sock. Um, I will put I'll put good detailed notes on my project page when I complete these socks if anybody wanted to try it. I'm not going to write it up as a pattern, but if anybody wanted to try and look at what I did and, and follow that, they could, I'll put good, I have good detailed notes as you can, <laughs> it's all my little chicken scratchy notes, but I've kept pretty good detailed notes of what I've been doing. Um, mostly so that for me to knit the second sock the same as the first, but I had finished the first sock a while ago. This is the first sock. It has stitch markers to count the rows for the foot. And I am about halfway through the second sock now. That got, I picked it up last week. I was there. So I had all of that. It's pretty good. Um, I'm using Yarn Ink, uh, her classic sock. Love this yarn as well. This is an Alberta yarn. Um, local to me. You probably heard of Yarn Ink, but if you haven't, you should and you should check it out. I love her yarn. And this is uh, in the slate colorway. Um, I think that's all I have to say about those. Oh, there is one thing I was going to mention. It sucks. So in the completed sock, I've tried it on and worn it around the house a couple of times. And I do wish that I had either done one by one rib on the top or maybe actually gone down a needle size. Or the ribbing is not as tight as I probably need it to be to really have. The rest of the sock fits like a glove. I tailored it to my leg all along as I knit it. This could be tighter to help hold the socks up. So... I think what I'm going to do, I mean, what I could, there are two options, one of which is I could pick up along there, rip it out, and, but I mean, I knit these top down, so, but I, I could re-knit the cuff as if they were toe-up socks. However, I actually think I maybe will just thread, get some elastic thread and run that through there to help just making sure that that isn't going to stretch out uh, enough to make the socks fall down. So that's what I'm thinking. It's probably elastic thread the way to go. I'll report back when they're finished. So that's all my works in progress. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to mention, um, because this is where I'm at, as I said, watching the Fruity Knitting podcast, looking at all the uh, beautiful sweaters that Andrea knits, and then um, uh, uh, being... Um, looking at sweaters that, you know, picking up the Birkin pattern and stuff, getting the Lane magazine, which I want to knit all the patterns in, a lot of which are garments, uh, has really taken me down the rabbit hole of how much, uh, of garment knitting again. Like I really, I want to cast on all the sweaters. And I have, as I said, quite a bit of sweater quantities of yarn in my stash. And so I've been looking at what I have and looking at patterns and, and trying to match sweater quantities in my stash to patterns that I like. And getting into this real, like, I want to knit all the sweaters. Um, that will probably pass. I, I do that. I get obsessed with something for a while. And then I move on to being obsessed with something else. But um, I do see a few more sweaters in my um, future come the fall. And I was going to show you, the last thing, I was just going to show you a few of the, pa the patterns that I'm looking at and really considering right now. Um, this is Tegna, which is also a Caitlin Hunter. She, she did the Birkin gonna get blown out a bit by the light I apologize but the Tegna 
a sweater by Caitlin Hunter is a very cute little um, with this lace detail on the bottom of the hem, short sleeved, and I have some, um, I think it's a hemp, it's a hemp cotton wool blend, some lovely yarn that would work really nicely I think for that, and I'm considering that. This is another um, pattern that I really want to make, it's been in my queue for a while that I have some fun, colorful um, yarn from Easy Knits UK that I think I will use for that. And it's the pavement sweater. I'm sorry, these are not showing up super great because of the glare of the light on the my iPad. But the pavement sweater by Vera Valamaki. Uh, and the last one that I'm really obsessed with right now, I don't actually have yarn that would be suitable for this, so I would have to buy some. But... Um, uh, is I really want to knit a cable sweater and I've been looking uh, oh there look you can see it it's the um, on Dawa sweater by Michelle Wong and it I would probably make it a little longer that's a little too cropped for me but I just really love all that gorgeous textury cable stuff and really kind of want to make that but I have to get some yarn for that. I'm thinking of, I don't know if I mentioned, I am going to Knit City in Vancouver in um, uh, at the end of September. So I'm very excited about it. I'm taking a class with Stephen West. Um, and I am thinking I may look for a, a sweater's quantity of yarn for that cable sweater. I definitely want to look for a sweater's quantity of yarn there. I'm going to try really hard to limit how many single skeins of fingering weight I buy, which like a lot of us is my default, but um, anyway. So yes, I'm very excited about going to Knit City and I and if you're going, I hope you'll let me know and uh, uh, I'm going by myself. So I will know a few people kind of there from, from the online knitting community, but I won't really know anybody there um, in in real life particular. Well, that's not true, actually. My friend Carla, who lives here, will be there, and I do know Carla, and um, a couple, one or two other people that I do know. But um, but I'm really looking forward to hanging out with some of the people that I do know and interact with a bit online um, through either the podcast or on Instagram and all that kind of thing. And I'm looking forward to also meeting some, some new knitters. So I'm super excited about it, and uh, let me know if you're going too. And maybe we can, you know, hook up and have a, a coffee or a beer or something in it. So that is all I have to talk to you about today. I think I'm just looking at my notes and I think I covered everything. Um, I did have, oh, I'm not going to do this today. I do have a whole pile of, I've been bad. Well, some of his gifts, to be fair. I have a pile of, of uh, acquisitions. Um, but the, looking at where I'm in this podcast today, I will save those, I think, for the next episode. So, um, Stay tuned with my next recording and I will show you uh, the new yarn that has been coming into my house over the last couple of weeks since I recorded last. So in the meantime, that's everything for this week. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed spending uh, hours or so of your time with me. And until I talk to you next time, happy knitting.